I do want to try and give a little bit of a flavour of some of the more macro issues that we need to deal with if we're trying to understand how to take forward a more sensible way of using public resources across the different needs within, within the health and social care systems. So I'm going to try and be as boring as possible because a lot of these issues are really quite detailed and boring. And if I have one single message, this may surprise any of you who are working in the sector at the moment, but if I have a single message is that it's all very complicated. And if you didn't quite get that, I could say another thing, it's all incredibly complicated. And we really need to embrace the fact that the issues we're dealing with are complicated ones rather than ones that we're going to resolve with simple um, sweeps of, of, of particular policy. Now, I take a very simple view of resource allocation, and that is resource allocation should be the servant of policy. We should work out what we're trying to do, and we should use our resource allocation systems as ways of trying to achieve what we're trying to achieve. Now, this may seem rather, rather an obvious thing to want, but in the public debate, you practically never see this clear linkage between what are the underlying objectives and what are the mechanisms and processes we go through to try and achieve them. The approach I would take also tries to build on the evidence. That's to say, we actually know a lot about what works and what doesn't work, but what we know about is very often left out of the debates on what we should do. And I believe it's as far opposite as that as possible. I also think it's important for us to understand that needs are changing and uh, have already changed. And under these circumstances, we really need to be focused on where things are going rather than just focusing more narrowly on where we are at the moment. And we need to be very clear that when we do reform, we do reform because it's going to make things better rather than simply as a response to problems as perceived. And if I have time, I'll have some concluding thoughts. So when we're starting off looking at the resource allocation issues, we really need to start off working out what is the objective, what are the objectives stated in health policy. And uh, to what extent are these shared by the different political and uh, interest groups within the system? Now, one of the things that's very interesting, I think, is if you sit down and look at policy statements across different political interests, they're all remarkably similar. The goals that they describe are very similar, even if the pathways that they're discussing may be very different from each other. And one of the things I think is sometimes useful is to try and identify what are the key objectives that we're trying to make the resource allocation system useful for. Now, we all know that uh, there have been a lot of previous attempts to change the way we do things, and a lot of those attempts have been unsuccessful. And under those circumstances, I think we also need to try and learn from what has and what has not been successful in the past. And I would particularly say that all our emphasis really should be on processes and not so much on structures. It's very easy when we discuss failures in the health system to think those failures are to do with the fact that it's been put together in the wrong structure. My view is that's practically never the case. It's almost always the case that the problem is that we have the wrong processes for making the decisions and the allocation decisions within that. So my goal in life is to try and ensure a link between policy goals and policy actions. And the policy actions are typically small, detailed, focused things around the way we allow the resources to flow and the resulting services and access to appropriate care that comes from that. Now, I just want a 15-second diversion why I care. I was, uh, I think, in many ways privileged to have 46 years of uh, being the closest sibling to a brother who had Down syndrome. And during that period, I spent a lot of time trying to help navigate through the complexities of the support that he, he needed. And we did well, but then we were a good middle class family. We had reasonable resources ourselves, and we were very good at it. And we did well in getting him through the system. We don't say we got it all right, but we did quite well. But we also observed a huge amount of failure of the systems we were working within to provide anything like an appropriate body of support. And that's really how I ever got into this business. So the Rwan group who uh, did the resource allocation report in 2010 
started off with a simple transparent model of population needs. We were saying the starting point in trying to understand where we're trying to go is to be clear about what population needs should be. We were looking to have a national policy implemented locally. Now that may sound like a, an odd thing to bother to say, but very often there's confusion as to whether we're looking for local policies that are locally allowed to differ or national policies that are implemented locally to take account of local circumstance. And I would be very much in favor of the second of those. We would want the process to try and deliver safe, sustainable, cost-effective, evidence-based care in appropriate settings, wherever they occur. Now again, what we're trying to say here is the whole process, as much as is feasible, should be driven by the knowledge and evidence around what works and how much it works and how much it's worthwhile. And to deliver that, we're looking for financial incentives which are appropriate to uh, promoting healthcare and well-being in line with national, nationally determined policies. Now, I've had a very short diversion on why I think financial flows are so important. I was talking some time ago to a person with serious mental health problems who was being looked after in the outpatient service of a, of a hospital. And he was regularly going back to the outpatients in the hospital when his needs could perfectly well have been managed in his GP service. And I asked him why he wasn't doing so, and he said, because I would have to pay 55 euro a time if I went there, and I get it free at the hospital. I may have serious mental health problems, but I'm not stupid. And I think understanding the way in which financial incentives can drive people's behavior and expect what is inevitably going to happen, people will pursue directions that are in line with their incentives. So what we're looking for in any better system is, one, is a system that encourages people to use services in the right place at the right time, rather than encouraging them to go to the places that uh, are going to be cheapest for them to go to. Now, how are needs changing? Well, about 70 to 80 percent of all things done in the health and social care arena are done in the context of people with chronic problems, continuing problems. We have a system that's set up largely on the premise that you have a one-off need that gets dealt with and you go away again. And yet the overwhelming majority of people who are being cared for are being cared for with long-term chronic conditions that need continuing responses over a long period. And many of the consequences of these chronic conditions can be anticipated and prevented. So it's often possible to do better if we get an earlier intervention than happens if you just respond to a problem as it occurs. Many of the interventions that are most effective are not very complicated. They just need the appropriate skills in the right place at the right time to achieve them. And I think if we get the logic of thinking about managing chronic disease and saying how can we get the resources to flow around a sequence of needs that people will have, you get a very different kind of outcome than if you look at funding episodic treatments when something happens and something goes wrong. So, what we need, therefore, is to try and ensure that the systems of funding and payments that we put into the, to the healthcare and social care arena are ones that recognize continuing needs and the need to fund services that have continuity and perpetual uh, responses built into them. And a lot of the argument about universal benefits has really not got so much to do with whether it's fair or equitable, although I would always want them to be fair and equitable but much more to do with ensuring that they re reflect the kinds of needs people have which are continuing rather than one-off, are continuing rather than episodic. And we know that aging is changing the patterns of these needs, although one of the encouraging things from recent research is that aging actually isn't terribly important in terms of changing the overall burden that's going to fall on the health and social care systems. It's just going to change the nature of that burden very significantly. It's not going to increase it at anything like the rates that often people have been, been suggesting. It's interesting that all the evidence is showing that age-related disability rates are actually falling slightly at the moment. People are fitter at any given age on average than they were before. 
There's some evidence of a postponement of morbidity as well as some evidence of, of a compression. There's another interesting thing that's changing in the environment, and that is the number, although the number of single elderly people in the population is rising, the proportion of elderly people living alone is falling. This is the good news story for men. Men are now living longer, and there are more couples remaining viable in the community as a result. This is my men are useful after all story, which may not be quite the tone that was given in the earlier session when men clearly never understand anything. <laughs> now, this all pushes us towards saying we need to try and strengthen the primary and community to systems, and we need to do it in systematic ways, and we need to fund it in ways that will help that to happen. It's not just about buildings. If you lived over the last few weeks, you might think it was all about buildings. I was promising myself I wouldn't say anything about buildings today, but it isn't all about buildings, although they can be helpful. But it's about trying to understand there's really no distinction between primary and community services. What we need is ways of funding things that will encourage people to go to the right bit of the system and the right bits of the system as they pursue their way through it. And this area is hugely underdeveloped, not only, as I say, in terms of facilities, but in terms of skills and patterns and the ways we use these kinds of services. We encourage and reward episodic care in, as opposed to continuing and um, progressive care through the system. And we have financial incentives that drive people out of this area in quite inappropriate ways. The whole situation with entitlements is, I think, best described as just a mess. One of the things I find interesting, I have a lot of dealings with people in uh, both the HSE and the uh, Department of Health. The thing that's most interesting is doing quizzes on what entitlements are with people who are responsible for large parts of the system. And I don't blame them for not knowing. It's actually incredibly complicated to know who's entitled to what at what stage. And uh, I actually, if you read the expert group report, the Rwan report, you will find an error in it. And I'd like to uh, set this as a quiz for you. If you can find the error and write to me, you'll get a prize. <clears throat> there was an error because we actually misunderstood the entitlements, even though we were incredibly clever and well-informed. So we need to look at the entitlement system, I say not only about fairness, but much more importantly, I think, about efficiency. Because at the moment, the patterns of entitlement means that some people are driven into the wrong part of the system because they have entitlements there, but are not allowed to be kept in the right parts because they don't have entitlements there. And I think there'll be huge gains from improving entitlements in the primary and community area in order to reduce people's reliance on services elsewhere. So where does this drive any thoughts about reforming the healthcare system and the reform we're going in? Well, I think the overwhelming need is to focus on the primary and community services as where the reform is most needed in terms of the structures and systems, but particularly the systems for funding care. And uh, we really need to look very carefully at all the incentives in this area to make sure it is better for the provider to provide the right service, and it's better for the user of services to use it in the right place and with the right support. The, uh, there's no evidence that diversity in the way we fund services makes it easier to manage that kind of very complex mess. We need to find ways in which everybody can get driven in the right direction at the right time. And I think there's far too much emphasis on ideas like choice which are very difficult to implement in such a complicated circumstance, and very often choice ends up giving you the wrong incentives and pushes people into the wrong parts of the system. So single funds and single payers are much more likely to be able to navigate through some of this complexity than having multiple funds and multiple players, payers. You can see already the complexity we get in the private insurance system in Ireland where there are three large organizations providing insurance, and I would defy any one of you in here to work out what is the best policy for yourself. There is no danger you would select the right one. Out of the hundreds there, you will certainly get it wrong because nobody can contain in their head enough information to be able to get that right. The only thing more difficult than that is deciding who should empty your dustbin in Dublin. I want to emphasize here that uh, any structures can work and any structures can fail. And any financing system can work and any financing system can fail. 
what we need to do is not to look at what we call the system, but how the system is structured and how it works and how the flows of resources reflect what we're trying to achieve in terms of who gets what. And this is where I come back to being dull. And I'm sorry to have been so dull this morning, but we have to learn to be dull and learn to be focused. We have to learn that the things that are really important don't make headlines. The things that are important are really complicated and fiddly, and we need to get focused on that. Any system <coughs> needs to set limits, and we have to be open enough to say there are things that work that we won't do, but we want to try and make sure that the things that work that we do do are the more important ones, and at the moment it's largely a question of chance. I was once talking to a group of cardiac surgeons I was going to say some friends who are cardiac surgeons, but that would obviously be a contradiction. And uh, I said to them, looking at the way you choose which patients to treat, all looks a bit random. And the man looked up at me and said, in a sad sort of tone in his voice, it's actually much worse than that. It's completely arbitrary. And uh, I think the problem we're facing with so much is arbitrary in who does and who doesn't get through the system because the incentives are not in any appropriate sense structured to help you do the right things. But if you have a well-structured system, those who don't get through, you hope, are those who are least important to get through. It doesn't mean they don't have needs, but they don't have needs that are going to come to the top of the priority pile. And we need evidence on how to affect change because a lot of the problems are that we know what works, but we don't know how to make what works happen. And one of the big gaps in our understanding is how to make appropriate structures work in appropriate ways by having the right incentives and the right change processes to try and ensure that people get through the, syst through the system and end up in the right place. And we often know what a, a perfect uh, system would look like, but we don't know how you can implement it, particularly in the sort of challenging circumstances we're in at the moment. We need to make sure that the incentives are for the organizations to be as efficient as possible, because that's the way we get the most out of them. But we also know that, for example, and I don't want to say this too loud in case anyone's listening, but if you keep changing the structure of an organization, it always becomes more inefficient. Just in case you didn't hear that, if you keep changing the structure of an organization, it always becomes more inefficient, at least in the short run. And we really got to learn to leave things alone a bit in order to try and allow better systems to emerge out of that. Many of the proposed changes that we're seeing at the moment could bring significant benefits, but only if we have careful implementation that really focuses on how the money will flow on what basis and what will be achieved at the end of that. And I am not wholly pessimistic, but we need to be concentrating in these detailed, local, small, fiddly, and often slightly boring issues. So a few concluding thoughts. We have a policy to try and level up access to care, to bring it up to the best that's available to anyone for all. Increased demands will require that we have incentives to become more efficient in the way we do things, but we probably will need some additional resources too. But the critical thing is to try and ensure the additional resources go in the right places and provide the right sorts of incentives. We know that in a crisis it's more difficult to make changes, but having said that, a crisis is sometimes a time when you can open up possibilities for new and original thought and more flexible approaches to making change. The new structures may help, but really the critical thing is better systems of what are needed. And if you have been awake, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>